morning. morning. My name is Katie, and I'm the Director of Children's Ministries here at UUC Phoenix. Last week, we talked about that strong arc of UU ancestors upon which we rest. We talked about that feeling of strength, right? So Buckminster Fuller, super cool. But today I want to tell you about someone who's even cooler. Um, because they're still alive. And like, yeah, being alive is cool, right? Okay. So kiddos, Reverend Teresa Nanan Soto wanted to be a minister from the time they were four years old. Four. How many of you are four? How many of you have been four? Okay. So can you imagine at four years old, seeing Rev Christine and being like, that, I want to do that. I know actually that a few of you are that way and were that way. You saw the mic and were like, that's mine. But Rev Soto felt that way because they had been sitting in a church service. They belonged to a Christian church at that time with their father. And their father had to write down where their family was from. And there was this map of the U.S., and it was right where your family is from and go stick it on the map, which seems cool and seems community building. But even at four years old, Rev Soto knew that they had lived in all sorts of different places and couldn't quite figure it out where they were from. Where's the one place you're from? And they really wanted to get up there and preach about how we're all from everywhere. So can you imagine at four years old being like, I have a message? Yeah, because most four-year-olds do. <laughs> So Rev Soto was discouraged from pursuing the ministry and going into the pulpit. So instead they went to college for church administration because that's just like being a minister. No, it's not. They later went on to get their Juris Doctorate kiddos. Some of you already know this and grownups, but they studied law and studied law really intensely, but realized they still wanted to be in that pulpit. So they got their MDiv, Masters in Divinity and they got ordained as a Unitarian Universalist minister. And now they are the settled minister at First UU Oakland. And they are a phenomenal leader in our faith. They work on issues of identity, white supremacy culture, ableism, and most important, love. And love in a really deep way about ourselves and how we can see and accept and heal and adore ourselves. And if you haven't read it yet, there's an amazing book of poetry called Spilling the Light that they released two years ago. And if you haven't read it, let me know because I have a few copies you could borrow. So does Rev C, okay? So we're gonna watch a video by Nanan today. And what, as you're watching, I want you to think about where it sits with you, but also where in that big arc, that dome that we talked about last week, you find strength in being part of this community because we all get to claim this identity as you use. Okay? And I think I'm supposed to say something cool like roll it. <laughs> roll it. <laughs> I'm making the title of this video. Are you sure, Reverend Teresa? Are you sure ableism is a problem? Because I know that there are probably some people who still want to know more. Like, there are reasons you're not sure, and you want to think about it with information. So, if that's you, if you're open to the possibility of learning more, then this video is for you. The first thing we should talk about is, what is ableism? Ableism is a bias. It's a way that oppression happens. And the spectrum that it's on is comparing able bodies with disabled bodies. What ableism says is that able bodies are great and disabled bodies are not great. Is this true? Well, that's a complicated question. 
but I can tell you two ways of thinking of it. One is that for many disabled people, they experience challenges. You experience challenges in an able body, right? You get the flu, you get a cold. It's not the same thing. And it helps us think about what makes a body good or bad. One of the things I would say is that we can't say people's bodies are bad unless we live in them. And because one of our possibilities is to show gratitude and love for each person who exists, the quality of their body isn't something that we need to debate. Our responsibility as beloved community isn't to identify the good bodies and the bad bodies. It's to create a space of love for everybody. See how that works? And then we can build from there. So, so far, we've talked about how ableism is a bias and how one of our responsibilities in beloved community is to create space for bodies. I'm going to stop here and say the thing I haven't said yet. And that is that it's not up to us to tell whether people's bodies are good or bad. But in fact, being disabled is not just uh, a shame or a disappointment or a hard thing. It's also just how some people come factory installed. So what I would say is that being disabled is just another way of having a body. And I'm gonna put that here for you. That brings us to consideration of this question. What does the existence of bias have to do with the words of songs we sing or names of organizations? Just as two examples. This is a two-part answer. Are you ready? The first part is that whatever we're doing in services needs to be representative. One way that people are used to thinking of liturgy in services is as the work of the people. And whether or not that's precisely accurate, the shared aspect of a service is really important. One thing I would say is that when we give no consideration to the disabled people in our services, then we're not doing that shared work as well as we could be. People with disabilities are consistent 10% of any population. So that's something for us to remember as we talk about this. It matters that we give a wide representation to people who are sitting in chairs in our pews, with walkers in our pews, using the hearing loop, using large print, using braille, all the different ways that are possible to participate in our congregations matter and they're worthy of including in the liturgy of our movement. <laughs>